welcome to Silver Lining for Learning, episode 155. This is a host reflection show coming to you on June 17th in the summer of 2023. And we're going to let any topics come up in, in the pregame warm up. We were talking about Seymour Papert and his vision for coding across all age groups, and particularly with young people, to get them to program to think. I remember, oh, it was 19, 1995. My class was assignment was to read Elliot Soloway on um, logo as Latin and to read um, one of Chris's former colleagues there. I'm blanking on his name now, uh, who, you know. David Perkins? The, the, uh, David, uh, it was David, but it was another David. Okay. Uh, he was studying from West Virginia. You would know him, um, our okay. friend. Anyways, I assigned a couple of people to read that week, and uh, the students were just tearing into the articles on whether programming had, had an impact on thinking. We did this through Vax Notes. It was all a asynchronous discussion during the week, and and they were they were just tearing into the articles from from. Uh, it was David Palumbo. Uh, David uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and and El Elliot Solway, and then on I don't know the, the class time a week later, we brought Elliot Solway in, and we brought in David Palumbo using CUC Me and PictureTel. We combined two video conferencing systems together, perhaps for the first time, and the students who were shaking their heads no and were criti criticizing everything to do about. Um, Papert's work and about Elliot Soloway and, and David Plumbo and everyone else who was covered in that particular week, they were shaking their heads yes. We had faculty walking by the hallway to that class that combined these two video conferencing systems together. And they actually, for the first time ever, and maybe the only time, they walked into the class and sat down to watch what was going on. And it was really an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it, was, it was in a room that had kind of a well, an oval table and, you know, everyone was really engaged and we're watching this grainy text from CUC Me, watching Elliot Solomon. It looked like Santa Claus coming in on the big screen and, you know, all kind of looked white. His beard was white because, you know, it wasn't high resolution here. It was a free video conferencing system in the early days, I think built by Cornell at the time. And we were just experimenting. Um, the School of Ed was three years old at the time at Indiana University. It was an experimental site for tech and education. And so we were playing around and trying this out and having some guest speakers. And then I wrote that piece up as, you know, talking about apprenticeship, how we could apprentice students through combining uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, activities and all sorts of things. Uh, anyways, our, our, that, that pre pre-show, before the show discussion was, you know, really about how to, you know, we've talked about Seymour Papert, is about how to give students empowerment, you know, how, how to engage the learners, how to how to uh, have reflective moments in the process, because Papert would sit down next to the kids as they were coding in Logo and ask them questions about what they were doing. Um, and the day Papert almost died, <laughs> the first time, was in December 2006, when he was hit by motorists in Vietnam in Hanoi, walking across the streets of Hanoi, talking to Andy DeSizer or somebody like that. And uh, they were both making comments about how complicated the roads were and how the traffic was all messed up. And Papert said to, to DeSizer, he says, uh, we, should fix, we should come up with an algorithm to fix the roads. And just when he said that, he turned and he was hit by a motor, motorist or something, and, and, and he almost died there. Um, I was in Taiwan at the time and heard about it through Wikipedia news and read about it. And then I went to a computer lab in Taiwan um, with uh, young kids and asked them. I tried to be Papert for a day when interacting with the kids. Anyhow, um, we were talking about Papert coming in. Does anyone have um, personal experience with Papert and stories to tell about um, <clears throat> the you know research that you've done on having kids code and reflect and um, think about you know mathematics and other things well let me, let me step back from papert and and just take this in in a related direction but a somewhat different direction 
So in the news the last few weeks, there have been stories about students who were licensed as nurses in Florida. They passed the national nursing exam. They were licensed as nurses. And the hospitals where they were hired and the facilities where they were hired were really puzzled because they didn't know how to do things like draw blood or give a shot or do somebody's vitals. And they said, how, how could you have, how, how could you have gotten this nursing license? And it turns out that there were these, these, um, fake nursing schools that basically taught students how to pass the test, but that didn't give them any clinical skills at all. And so now, you know, these, these students who should have known better have, have a nursing license that's worthless and, and have spent a lot of money. So why am I discussing this? I'm, I'm, I'm discussing this for two reasons. First, it illustrates that these proxies, that the high stakes tests, um, whether it's in law, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in, you know, whatever field you care to name, are poor proxies for one's actual ability to do something. You can get a high score on the LSAT without being able to function at all in a law office and so on. And, and yet education is using those as its index, right? How, how high are the test scores of the students graduating from X? Well, th they're higher from this place than that place. So it must be a better education. That's a familiar theme for us, but I think it's a familiar theme that's being underscored by generative AI because, um, with thinking, with learning to think, developing knowledge and skills, the journey is the destination. The destination is not the destination. Having that high stakes test score, having that dissertation in your hand, having that published article, that's the destination, but, but it's not the real destination, it's a proxy and the real destination is the process of writing an article that can survive peer review of, of, um, you know, learning, um, systemic thinking and software development, as opposed to, to learning, uh, simple coding and so on. And I'm just really dismayed by most of the stuff that I read where people are saying, well, the goal of education is for students to produce essays, persuasive essays. And it doesn't matter uh, if AI does it and the student just edits it. No, the goal of education is to, is to have a thinking process that allows you to produce a persuasive essay eventually, an original uh, creative persuasive essay. And the essay itself is just a proxy. So I'm, I just feel as if there's a huge movement now to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it's just stunning to me um, that people who should know better are, are part of that movement. You know, I have- so Chris, uh... Chris, I'm a product of that. <laughs> I'm trained as an accountant at the University of Wisconsin. At, I won't mention the name, but uh, two of the three years Last three years I was there as a student, we graduated the number one test taker in the entire country for the CPA exam. Uh, and you know, not, and I, I passed the CPA exam in the first trial without taking the review course or anything. I just, you know, they, they did gear us towards that, but I was a failure kind of as an accountant. I was pretty much, you know, kicked out, you know. Um, so, you know, training to the test doesn't necessarily make one, you know, a um successful you know person later in life and and I'm a, I'm a case in point of that i don't want anything to do with accounting anymore by the way budgets or anything like that but it was just it was so boring too so you know 
going through those rote lessons. I mean, so the first one of the first papers I wrote was how to enhance the accounting curriculum with um, critical and creative thinking and collaborate collaboration. So um, in the Journal of Accounting Education, it took me seven years to get it published, but it got published nonetheless. Um, anyways, um, you know, when I when I mentioned, I want to just go back to my original story. What was interesting there was combining asynchronous and synchronous, and the synchronous really woke people up to the possibilities that they didn't see earlier. They found that reading one article from a person didn't represent who they were, and that people's ideas change and evolve over time. And that was really important. And that's that's why I've embedded many synchronous and asynchronous activities in my classes to get you know students to to see different perspectives, to kick them in the seat of the pants, whack them in the side of the head um, a little bit in, in class. Sorry, Young, I just wanted to add that in that, you know, my experience is, is it, you know, exemplifies what Chris had just talked about the nursing students. Um, accounting programs are notorious for training, training to a, one exam and not thinking about um, what they're gonna be doing throughout their lives and today, you know, the accounting profession is undergoing dramatic changes um, and, and, and many more brought on by generative AI, which will be replacing many of the functions that they currently do. Uh, Young, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, I was uh, um, just thinking about um, several years ago, I think when the um, private school for profit universities were exposed uh, quite a number of those programs had the problem that Chris, you were talking about, you know, uh, basic, and they're just trying to get you to, you know, take federal loans and pay and then to practice taking the test. I, I think that that's, uh, I was, this is really several years ago was uh, about uh, nurses. How is that possible? But I think, you know, the, uh, the other thing I, I just want to chat about is, um, this uh, speak of news, this week I received an email from my university saying, please clean up your Blackboard account. So that's another thing to think about. Imagine all the learning platforms, Blackboard, I think many people are familiar with. So it looks like many universities finally are getting rid of their Blackboard uh, platforms, which has been going through you know, ups and downs. It was very popular, I think, in the beginning. You know, then uh, after so many years, it's gone. When uh, Kurtz talk about see you, see me, of course, now we have uh, the big deal of Zoom, Google meeting, you know, I mean, and Microsoft team. And uh, think about all the evolution, you know, the, the big changes over the past uh, 20, 30 years. And of course, the last few episodes have talked a lot about the growth of uh, open education resources and uh, and of course right now i've been in australia for two and a half weeks and everywhere you go is chat about chat gpt the impact of chat gpt i, I think students today uh, who are in learning design instructional design educational technology whatever you know field they're in it is a different era now in you know, you were talking about Samuel Peppert. That's uh, that moment. You know, I would have to say, you know, his books are were influential in a arena about thinking around computational tools, about uh, different ways to interact with the computers. You know, I think it's, of course, right now, you know, it's hard to say computers or uh, computing devices is very different. I think, you know, they, um, the last few episodes talk about uh, the growth of uh, uh, open education resources really is actually bring some really interesting things, several things I was thinking about. Number one, why has not really open education resources been more widespread? You know, th that is, uh, it, it's quite amazing, right? In, uh, you know, but at the same time, that's number two, uh, people are seeking information from open sources, right? I mean, you were talking about TikTok, we're talking about, uh, you know, YouTube, we're talking about various things. And number three, it's another thing, you know, last week uh, uh, when when Kurt, you brought in folks from uh, BYU uh, about 
those open books, then I, I, you know, I think we're getting old. Uh, we like to read articles, <coughs> we like to read books, but I, I also noticed a growing trend of younger generation of educators who are really not necessarily as interested or as we were forced to read books. We did not have as many video or, or, or TikTok or sort of things. You know, like I think I'm a, I'm not a, the video generation or I'm, I'm not even the audio generation. I still like to read. I think, but I think we have a generation of people who is not into reading. And uh, But acad in academia, if you look at it, our field, but unless you publish, you're still you're going to perish, right? That's still the idea. We accept uh, print still as the primary form of uh, scholarship. So that's just very interesting. Uh, just just to observe what has happened. I'm just really wondering about if uh, in academia, in the few years, would we accept? You know, in educational technology, psychology, or measurement, assessment, policy, whatever field we're in, would they accept video formally as publication or as uh, acceptable academic products? So anyway, that, that's just one of the things I'm very curious about. You know, George Felicianos may has a book on the digital scholar or digital scholarship. We might consider bringing him and someone else who are experts in digital scholarship in for one of our episodes about, you know, what what's being valued, how other things could be valued and, and so forth. I know in my current research on chat GPT, <laughs> on YouTubers in chat GPT, you know, we're, we're asking people about how they learn languages online. And the number one answer is YouTube videos. You know, I don't think anyone has started off mentioning books that they've read or articles that they've read or, you know, technical reports that they've read. They might mention, you know, TikTok, these short videos, but typically it's YouTube videos. Even for those in China where it's banned, they're finding ways around it and watching YouTube videos. Um, so that's kind of interesting. We've moved from an age of Wikipedia to an age of Videopedia. And now how do we, you know, um, change our system to get <clears throat> those that generate such video content for others have it be have that be accepted as a product for their tenure and promotion and and not just the publications that they've made and so forth anyways well, if you to take example kurt uh, uh, and chris just in what we've done for 150 times 55 yeah. times right and uh I don't think any university would consider what we've done as scholarship. It, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, you know, not my university, definitely. Uh, it's uh, uh, in thinking, you know, it, but, but we've done a lot, right? We've collected a lot of data. We've presented it in more acceptable in a format. It's been, you know, accessed by many people. And it did bring our brains in our time our work together. So, so it, it is, uh, you know, uh, again, it, it is a format that we've taken on, and, but I don't think it's generally accepted in as scholarly products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been nominated for a couple of things at my university, including distinguished professor, which I've not gotten of several, four times. Um, and they told me last time, you need to take those social media things out, like those YouTube channels and those, just take those out of your CV. They're, they're, so those don't count. They're, so they're, they're not going to look favorably on that, the social media outlets and so forth. Basically, is the message. Chris, you wanted to jump in. Well, in, in my course, um, I have a semester long project. Uh, that's, that's what students do. And um, the goal is to give them something for their professional portfolio, because at the end of the day, you graduate with a master's degree. Um, sure, it's nice to have a transcript, and it's nice if it says Harvard, and it's nice to have letters of recommendation. But at the end of the day, it's your portfolio that's going to get you a job. And so I say, don't worry about what I want think about what your portfolio needs and I'll find a way of evaluating what you give me. And part of that is that I, I they say, well, what, how many pages, right? 
double spaced or single spaced, right? All this stuff. And I say, nope, nope, wrong way to think about it. I say, you can give me a paper and it should be whatever length is the right length, uh, but more than X, because if you're working for a whole semester, you know, a five page paper isn't going to get it done. And, um, but you can also give me uh, an annotated PowerPoint presentation. So it could be PowerPoint with audio, or it could be that you present something, you know, with video and show PowerPoint, or it could be a website. Because, of course, there's lots of website builders now, and that way you can show the nonlinear relationships between things in ways that you can't show with the paper or the PowerPoint, because those are linear media. And I get a mixture, you know, of all those three kinds of things. And I have not seen variations in quality that are based on the medium. So there are obviously variations in quality among the papers or among the projects, but it's not like I say to myself, well, all of these PowerPoint annotated are not very good compared to the papers, so I should get rid of that. No. Or all the website ones, or all the ones where the students made a game and then they, they provided a, an annotations for the game. They're all, they're all perfectly acceptable ways of representing a set of ideas, and in fact, depending on what your ideas are, what it is that you want to show in terms of your knowledge and skills, one of them is probably better than choosing any of the others from your perspective of having a portfolio. And it's just sad that we don't do the same thing in scholarly terms, because it would be interesting to have, you know, uh, a, a scholarly outlet that was PowerPoint with annotations. And reviewers would have to use, you know, the same standards that we use for papers. Is, is this evidence-based, you know, are you familiar with the literature that shows what's been done before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but wh why not? And, and why not have something where people create a nonlinear representation or even a game and annotate that? And again, it, it's not changing the standards. It's changing the p path by which you reach the standards. Well, so, that, that is the, uh, uh, you know, Chris, um, we are, uh, again, I really want to emphasize, we are not the young generation anymore. So, but yet, you know, it sounds like you, me, Kurt, uh, we have a view of scholarship can be done in, in different format. Uh, but even organizations like AECT, for example, which is supposed to be driving this, or or ISTE, you know, ISTE, uh, not uh, many of them. Once you produce in a multimedia format, it's automatically not considered high-end scholarship. So high-end scholarship has be has to be text. You know, that, that is it's just a fascinating. Uh, I mean, it's not new. It's this no, debate it's not new. Not new at all. You know, I remember when I first became a professor at the Michigan State University, 1990s, and there was discussion. But we seriously moved beyond that. You know, uh, I remember writing a little paper about uh, trying to justify hypercard uh, production software as scattered uh, scattered product for the Center of Early Childhood. Uh, a reading center. We're talking about that, but we even developed standards to evaluate, to judge, but it never took off. You know, ne nobody really said, yeah, that that is, we really treat that seriously. Think about Hyper Studio, you know, because nowadays we probably get a lot of educational technology researchers who don't do, uh, who don't really do tech technology, Chris, like you were saying, they, they, they can comment, they can write about it. Remember in our days, Almost every educational technology person has to develop software. Remember that we had to develop software. We had to play with the software to experiment, understand. So, so, but, but really, you know, over the last, I would say 30, 40 years, this hasn't changed. I, I can't believe we're talking about today, but I think it's appropriate to talk about today 
since we talked so much about open educational resources, you know, you know the, the OER and all the other things. And again, if, if education is preparation for life, it's not a goal in itself, it's preparation for life. And life, if you can do a game, if you can do a website, if you can do a annotated talk, that's valuable. I mean, your boss isn't gonna say, oh no, this is a really engaging talk. Uh, I wanted a paper, <laughs> you know, go back and write a paper for me. That's not, that's not life. So it's, it's, it's troubling. So I want to pick up another theme that you had mentioned, which is the YouTube videos for learning the language. I've, I've been negative about many aspects of large language models, but there are ways in which they are going to make a big positive difference. And I want to make sure that my thoughts on this are balanced. So um, there's a VR company, a French VR company called Wanda, W-O-N-D-A, that's working with some uh, colleagues at Harvard that I've worked with um, on, on learning French as, a, um, as an additional language, Harvard undergraduates who were taking French. And um, what, what these generative AI language models can now do is that they have solved the natural language dialogue problem you can sit down with one of those models and you can use idioms and you can use, you know, idiosyncratic analogies and you can use paraphrases and you can use whatever. And they just nail what the meaning is that, that, that you've created. And, and, and they cross language. So you can have a conversation where you're speaking in English to a, an agent, an AI agent who is replying in French, and that's a kind of language practice, or you're speaking in French to an AI agent that's responding in French. And this doesn't mean that, that you still need a human in the loop who is an expert language teacher, who when you're stuck in a pattern of errors and you can't figure out how to get out of it can intervene and help you. But what these AI systems can do and what Wanda is, is helping us do at Harvard is you can learn a language in the context and the culture in which it was developed. So the point is not to just have a native speaker that you're interacting with, but have a, a native speaker, even if that's an agent, an AI agent, who is <clears throat> embedded in a simulated context and culture. So if, if, if that sounds interesting to anyone, you should look at the WONDA website where there's some video clips of this. <clears throat> so that's something. It, it's not an accident they're called large language models. They really are able to do <clears throat> very interesting things with language. And, and so again, this gets into um, the, the concept of <clears throat> dialogues. Now, I'm not impressed by the idea that we could take, you know, all of Einstein's writings and create an Einstein chatbot. And now you can talk to Einstein because the fact of the matter is that Einstein wasn't a very good teacher. You know, he, he was a good thinker, <coughs> but he wasn't a very good teacher. And I don't think that a generative AI is capable of, of the kind of it might understand what you're saying, but it doesn't understand the, the background in pedagogy and andragogy that you need to give good answers with. So it's not going to replace teachers. But for simulations, right? For simulations where <clears throat> you say, well, you, you graduated in accounting, uh, you're interviewing for a job, I'm gonna give you um, a set of books that I want you to analyze. And then you're gonna meet with the client and you need to tell the client where the books are accurate and where the books are inaccurate and what they should do about it. And we're gonna assess your ability to do this. Well, then there are many parts to that assessment, but the natural language part of that assessment is now no longer an issue. That's a big deal, I think. So I wanna go back to OER for just a second. 
and um, and Chris's class that you mentioned, you know, whether you can do websites or podcast shows or YouTube videos with a paper, reflection of paper or some other products, you know, that sounds very, very similar to some several of the courses that I teach. And I'll just point out to the viewing audience or the listeners out there in podcast land that if you go to my homepage, kurtbonk.com, you can get all my syllabi. Um, in fact, if you click on where it says syllabi, you can get 30 years of syllabi. <coughs> you know, I have an open policy. I try and make everything available for my students. I have a course, a couple of them I've taught for three decades, and they can do a historical analysis of topics and how they changed over time and the pedagogies that I use. But I, I do think that empowering students by having them, you know, design something using the content of the class is vital for getting them to be self-directed learners, independent thinkers, whatever you want to call it, uh, within the discipline. I just want to, so I've tried to use an active pedagogy. Uh, again, I'm thinking maybe we need to bring people like George Valencianos from Canada in for a session. I'll contact him and maybe it gets him to recommend someone else and we can talk about this a little further. But I'm, I hearken back to a Chronicle of Higher Education article written over a quarter century ago where they discuss UCLA faculty in the humanities protesting, protesting that they had to put their syllabi online <laughs> for the students to review. And out uh, doing the protest with the students at the same time protesting with them were the students uh, in the humanities area and social sciences because the students were charged an extra fee for to have those syllabi online <laughs> and they didn't want to pay an extra fee. This is the, one of the first instances of required open uh, educational resource, be it uh, a college syllabus. And I looked at that and at the time I designed a 10 part web integration continuum of what you could what you could do with the internet all the way from just putting a piece or a syllabi online to putting a whole program up online the whole university online what are the things in between and uh, i wrote a paper on that the 10 part web integration continuum but anyways if you look at ucla you know uh, over time you would see that that mandate the top-down mandate made a difference at least i think for as an outsider looking in UCLA had done some fabulous things in terms of online teaching and learning over time. But of course, a lot of universities have been forced to do so. They were, an er, I guess, one of the early players in this. Uh, and I've just, again, I found that kind of interesting uh, how people's mindsets change over time. First, there's resistance and reluctance. Then there's understanding of what's possible then there's doing, then there's advocacy, and then there's sharing. There, uh, it, this cycle happens with MOOCs, it's gonna happen with ChatGPT, it happened with putting a syllabus online, the same thing. First awareness, then resistance or reluctance, throwing tomatoes at me for telling them that, that they need to do it. And then there's finally understanding and use of what's possible and, and then advocacy and sharing. Um, so yeah, Young, you wanna jump in on that? Not on that, not on the uh, 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 Los Angeles one, but but I, I I do really again want to go back to not so much question, but really asking the questions, especially like um, uh, the the books, because of the sense of ownership, because on the one hand you have a growing open resource, on the other hand. Publishers and you know, journals are charging a lot of money, you know, because one of the ways they do it, at least in education, is have this ranking of journals of control in that sense. And there are many universities, uh, at least, I mean, actually, when I do a lot of review, I'm sure you guys do too, every year for promotion, tenure for different universities, people are always still judging the so-called quality of journals. And of course, in science, we've seen that, that has been manipulated in like citation, self-citation, all those kind of things. Uh, 
So like you know, last week, you publish your books on your own website. Yes, you can do that, but that's not recognized. You know, uh, and so in education, you know, I'm right now editing the journal, RRE, in the Review of Research in Education for AERA. And, and it is very difficult, honestly, to find good peers, peer review. So, so you have this tension in education, what's considered open source, what's considered control, because a lot of publishers are making huge amount of money. And because you want to be in those journals, you know, for people to publish, you know, when you brag about it, maybe Kurt, when you said you want to apply for distinguished professor, you want to brag, oh, my journal in the top 10, you know, uh, you know, rankings, all, all those things. So I was just wondering about if any of this new technology, new possibility can change. You know, actually, it's so funny. I have to tell you, this is so strange. Like ARA, I'm editing for ARA, spending all my time. And the ARA is telling me, if you're not a member, you cannot edit for us. I said, How stupid is that? I said, now I'm trying to not be a member. So I'm not paying. I said, but I'm still editing. I said, well, fire me because you got all the journal in the process. I just don't like that idea. You work for them for nothing. And then they want, I was just thinking this whole process of journals is really as very strange. And so I'm just really trying to random and talking about open and closedness ranking of high quality. I think a lot of organizations are thriving on the ability to certify others. This is happening in schools. You know, you get a Harvard degree versus an Indiana degree. You know, you, you get, a, you, you, we talk a little bit about, you know, learning does not have to happen in schools, but certification has to happen because of schools. When Chris talk about, you know, certified nurses, it's the same kind of story. I was just really fascinated by how open our society can be about learning. Well, I, I think this goes back to proxies again. So the, the journal ranking is a proxy and, and it means that you don't need to read the article, right? You say, I'm too busy to read all these articles. This person's coming up for tenure. Let me just make sure that they're publishing in the top journals. And I know the reviewers will have kept them honest. And of course, that's very flawed, not because the top journals aren't careful about what gets published in them, but because there might be better stuff that's published in non-top journals that is more creative, that pushes the limits of the field more, that's too new in its ideas to be evaluated by conventional reviewers and so on and so on. So it's a proxy that locks everybody into the rear view mirror and it's a proxy that rewards sort of uncreative, conservative, traditional scholarship, as opposed to rewarding people for pushing the edges of the field. And I think that this is also true of what's holding back OER, proxies. So here I am, I'm, I'm posting a position in for some kind of job related to education. I have 70 applicants. I know that I can't go through 70 applicants in detail. So I need a filter. I'm gonna use some kind of proxy. So I say, well, did you graduate from a leading university? If you didn't, bang, you're out the door. Now I'm down to 15. Now that's maybe more manageable. But of course, what that is a proxy for is partly that you hopefully got a good education when you paid all that money, but it's also a proxy that filters out people who can't pay all that money or who, or who can't go be full time in Cambridge, Massachusetts or wherever for a year. So it's a poor proxy actually for quality, not because the university hopefully isn't delivering value, but because it's not an open resource that anybody can get that value. And then you can look at who did the most with it. So, so that's a big problem because um, 
if if you're not looking at portfolios, if your first step isn't some kind of sophisticated way to evaluate portfolios, that maybe it's automated, but at least it's sophisticated, then you're going to use proxies that screen out all sorts of people who should be in, in the mix because of diversity, because of SES, because of thinking outside the box and, and so on. And I think that that's a huge problem for OEM because if, if, you, if you are sort of self-directed learner and you, have a, and you can write or present something that's better than the typical graduate of an elite university, you're going nowhere because you'll be filtered out before people even see that. And, and we, need to, we need to change this use of proxies. You know, um, I, I, that comment about praxis is interesting because I was really thinking about coming with the open open source, all those things. I was really worried about one thing is, is location. So if you're born, let's say, in rural Indiana, I'm sure, Kurt, you guys have some rural Indiana. And... Uh, uh, then versus, of course, the big city of Bloomington, you know, uh, which is, I'm sorry, it's not really a big city, but but think about the the opportunities you have. I was thinking about where I was born, the village in China, or a village right now in, I mean, Ukraine. So so any person born in certain places carries a strong probability of having access to this proxy, you know, or consider authority or not. And so I was just wondering, Chris, um, if we, if Harvard get a child who has been, you know, 18 year old, but born raised in a very tiny village in war-torn Sudan, for example, how is that child going to access this? Because I'm thinking about, you know, right now with YouTube, TikTok, even if these resources are available, do people have the mindset or motivation to access them? So and if not, what can education do? Of course, this is a question that's from a lot of, you know, kind of, you know, philanthropists are thinking about. Uh, about. So I've been thinking a lot of how location of a person's birth defines that you know in the u.s we've been talking a lot about how we do not want your zip code to define the quality of your education but it certainly does and but then we governments use reading scores and math scores to as the proxy to say okay are you having a good education or not but it is actually not the same you know when talk about rural indiana um, versus this indianapolis it might be different or of course inner cities you know, may be very different from suburbs. You know, we know that all of this, but I just want what I was thinking about all this open source, the proxies, uh, and children technically can truly learn uh, you know, from various sources, but then they are controlled by the system uh, to be authorized, to be certified as quantifying citizens or quantifying workers. So you've got me thinking about who can we bring in for a show related to that, uh, you know, and I, I, I have an email, I've, as I've mentioned before, I've talked to a person who has created a refurbished computer program for students in, in Africa. She won the CNN Hero Awards that, you know, I'm still, we're still negotiating and, and so forth. You also it got me thinking about place-based education, and there are a couple of books out there on, you know, geographic-based ed education. I'm not, I'm not an expert in the area. I've got at least one former student who is or knows about it. I might ask her for some recommendations there. We might be able to bring someone in to talk about, you know, place-based learning, if you will. Um, not necessarily talking about an equity issue here, but it includes, you know, students in rural Indiana learning in different ways and with the resources they have or the funds of capital that they have in their communities. Um, I've had a program in rural Indiana for about five years, you know, 
with with t a blended program of teachers trying to get them to reflect on how they integrate technology and that was very successful and very interesting and i'd love to expand that a little bit um so so yeah you, you bring up a, a really important point young um and i i think we have to start you know filling in some of the gaps in our upcoming shows with some of the things we've mentioned today um and so I, you've got me thinking about who who i can bring, bring in or who we can bring in or target young you want to jump in well i was just thinking about uh it's you know like place-based education i've read some of those things you know there's a a very interesting uh, uh tension uh I, I mean this is happening actually in canada as well as many other places you know like a child who is in a place in rural area on the one hand you want to give them an education based on their community and but at the same time an education takes them away that's why you say the shrinking of uh, rural villages of rural communities and so so you know in, in my place the same thing my, my little village in china is that uh, on, on the one hand you want to give the child a good education which can boost you know improve the local community you know so they would stay but on the other hand if they get a good education they go away so so th this is uh, uh it, it's I, i'm not i don't mean to confuse all of us but but those are the troubles i think in education we all have to to face and discuss especially with the new technologies i am sure you know uh, chat gpt and versions of that will reach rural villages will be on phones i mean it's already on phones but they will do a lot more but do they really change people's lives i mean when you said occurred like uh, indiana uh it's a successful and what do you mean by successful so i'm just thinking about the lifelong you know i'm really again going back to chris example of uh, of a nurse who cannot draw blood you know so so what is that success mean you know and chris said another word, phrase i like a destination is destination you know but what is really the destination of human education i think this show as we talked before punya talked a lot about this too you know we we want to really probably deal with a little bit of uh where is education going because we've been talking a lot about teaching and learning we might want to be talking about a broad sense of education because education you know so far has been dominated by those who benefit from education you know, i'm just thinking about the books who wrote the books right and and who is the controlling the resources who is controlling uh certification i'm just thinking about all those process you know, for example, I've been really thinking a lot about this so-called achievement gap. And politicians, civil rights leaders accept that, you know. If you do not score well on your state test in reading and math, you have an achievement gap. And the government in or governments, in their good heart, they want to help you improve. And to help you improve, they put you in remediation. Therefore, you don't have time for something else. But is it possible to say that the achievement gap is actually a way to colonize other people? We use those reading test scores to define people, to hold them back from actual real opportunities where they could take to become better in other domains. You know, could we question that? But no, but you know, right now it's very few people question what you say when I got we got to do more. Third grade rating, we have to drive more, you know, kindergarten readiness. Because we are really, I think, probably not using a certain perspective to define other people's life. You know, I think uh when Chris and you guys were talking about, you you could be a very successful YouTuber if you are good at doing video, you have insight. You don't really need necessarily to do that. I don't mean, I'm not arguing against reading, but you know, if testing uh, in reading does not really mean you can read or not, you know, it's a proxy or does not capture all the capacities a person needs. So anyway, that's just a lot of my thinking recently about could achievement gap as a political ploy, you know, to drive children into things which 
they're just waste of their time. You want to jump in? Anybody? That's just a, a bigger educational questions, not classroom teaching, you know. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about today, and this is a nice lead in to it, is admissions. So <clears throat> I'm uh, on an advisory board for one of the major publishers that's about AI and data, responsible use of data. And as part of that advisory board, there are some attorneys who specialize in data privacy and um, some in the US and some in Europe. And one of the one of the one in Europe was talking about the fact that there are now lawsuits in Europe against companies who are using AI in the hiring process. Because the the applicants are correctly making the case that AI has many flaws and that it's a way of um, blaming the computer for discriminatory practices. Um, and yet, I hear many colleges, including elite universities, say that they're thinking about using AI for admissions. Well, huh, you know, the same arguments apply, and I imagine that we will see some lawsuits coming out of that. But what, what on earth is AI going to do to um, improve the admissions process? because all of us have probably served on decades of admissions committees. And you know that there are applications about which reasonable people can disagree. You know, it's like a Rorschach plot. You, one person sees this and another person sees that and you have a long discussion about it. And, and you make a case for somebody that the majority of the committee may have started out against, but end up getting in because you made a persuasive case or you make a case against somebody who people may have been initially excited about, but you point out some red flags. Hey, I can't do any of that. And it's just the mindless, the, uh, I have to, AI, generative AI is mindless, but there's a lot of mindless people or at least people who are mindlessly suggesting ways that it can be used in ways that I think are deeply troubling. And this is gonna be one more thing that gets into the issue of who gets in and who doesn't get in, who, who is disabled by the proxies that are used against them. You know, Chris, um, I was reading, this is several years ago now, three or four years ago, Virginia school districts are using AI to make judgment about hiring teachers. So this was uh, uh, several years. So they, they, I was quite shocked at that. You know, they, they were basically using at that time. I'm sure where companies were producing specific, not these language models. This before these language models to make judgment about the portfolio of teachers and make recommendations to the school district where they want to hire them. I'm sure, you know, large school districts have huge number of applicants. And so they're using that to sort it out. Uh, I, I don't know the software. I was just reading, I said, is this an appropriate way of doing that? And especially when you made comments about, there are a lot of, you know, probably careless people. They're not necessarily more thoughtful than your machine can do. And, and so I, I, I'm not sure, I just want to just add that, you know, Kurt? No, I was thinking about <laughs> applying for a job in 10 years and having an AI bot be also applying for the job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then going to interview and how, how well would I fare? No, I, I've read this, about admissions and you know it's it's confusing at this point for most people what what's what's going to play out in the long run um i don't really have a lot to say or comment on that um do we want to take we got just a minute or two left do we want to go back and cycle back to the, the the intro about um you know how this maybe affects the vision that people 
30, 40 years ago had for education of, of learners participating in their own education and, and constructing knowledge and you know coding things as a, a, a mechanism for learning. Um, you know, uh, the vision I in my from my perspective, the possibilities and the technologies, you know, we got to go back to John Seely Brown's articles, Minds on Fire, where you know he reflects on his ideas or his article on situated cognition from 1988 and 89. And then in 2008, 2009, with the web 2.0 and multiple forms of participation in one's own learning. And he said, and, and he said basically that, you know, a lot of the ideas that they, that he and others, Paul DeGood and, and Alan Collins and others who are working in, in, in that area back in the late eighties really come to distinct possibilities with the multiple forms of knowledge representation that can take place both uh, te with technological means as well as, you know, standard um, pen and paper kinds of things. We, you know, we've changed. We've, we've, we've changed as a culture, the opportunities in education, but it hasn't been equitable is what you're saying, Young. And, um, you know, it's important for us to reflect from time to time on and, and to bring in people who might talk about equity in education and the possibilities thereof. We're getting close to time to introduce. Anyone want to make a final comment? I just want to just ask a, a big question, which has no answer. Is educational technology as a field going to survive? Uh, because everybody in essence can be doing educational technology. So that's just uh, um, something just to think about, you know. Yeah, and everyone grabs a piece, right? You know, you got learning sciences people and, you know, we have uh, people looking at human computer interaction and, and other kinds of things and distance education. There's <laughs> the field of learning design and technology gets sliced apart and maybe exactly. it has to re reform and, and merge, I, you know. I, I think, you know, we probably will see the di disappearance of educational technology as a independent field. Uh, I don't know how long, but I think because everybody else is diving into chat GPT, into AI, into the ethics, you know. So, so you, you know, distance learning, for example, as a program, does not really exist anymore you know like uh we can be next door to each other we're still running distance learning right i mean we can be on the computer so it's just fascinating to think about i think chris has to introduce our next episode so um i'm i'm glad that i can um stretch out my career but not be eliminated because i'm an educational technologist i guess that's one of the few benefits of being uh, a senior person um, next week, episode 156, will be on educating children in Africa for a fast-changing world. And we will have three guests from different parts of Africa, and one of them also is in the Middle East countries, uh, looking at the highly innovative things that are going on in, in Global South countries to um, prepare students in many cases, I think better than we're preparing them in developed countries. So uh, I hope you'll tune in for that episode 11 in the morning on um, the 24th. And I hope everyone has uh, a nice week. And for those of you who celebrate Father's Day, a nice Father's Day. Mm -hmm.